Hi everybody and welcome back to video number 10 in chapter 16. And when we left off we were looking at cash flow hedging and here was that final um, settlement futures contract where we debited cash for 25,000 and credited the future con futures contract for 25,000 representing the difference between one million five hundred and seventy five thousand and one million five hundred and fifty thousand so the effect of the cash of the hedge on cash flows we wish to fix the cash paid for inventory at one million five hundred and fifty thousand dollars so our actual cash flows were one million five hundred and seventy five thousand and the cash we received on the futures contract was 25000 representing the final cash paid of $1,550,000. There are no income effects at this point. <clears throat> Allied accumulates in equity the gain on the futures contract as part of other comprehensive income until the period when it sells the inventory affecting earnings through cost of goods sold. Now, journal entries at July 2026 assume that Allied processes the alumina, aluminum into finished goods cans, and the total cost of the cans, including the aluminum purchases in January 2026, is $1,700,000. Allied sells the cans in July for $2 million and records this sale as follows. We're going to have cash that we receive, we'll debit, credit sales revenue of $2 million. And then we'll do the cost side with a debit to cost of goods sold and a credit to the inventory of our cans for $1,700,000. Now, since the effect of the anticipated uh, transaction has now affected earnings, Allied makes the following entry related to the hedging transaction. And on July, in July 26, July 2026, it's going to debit unrealized holding gain loss equity for $25,000 and credit cost of goods sold for $25,000. The gain on the futures contract, which Allied reported as part of other comprehensive income, now reduces the cost of goods sold. So as a result, the cost of the aluminum included in the overall cost of goods sold is $1,550,000. All right, so now we'll take a look at identifying special reporting issues related to derivative financial instruments that cause unique accounting problems. Other reporting issues, we'll talk about embedded derivatives. Hybrid securities have characteristics of both debt and equity. For example, a convertible bond consists of two parts. One, here, a debt security referred to as host security, and number two, an option to convert the bond to shares of common stock is the embedded derivative. Okay, now to account for an embedded derivative, the company should separate it from the host security and then account for it using accounting for derivatives. This separation process is referred to as bifurcation. So, qualifying the hedge, uh, and the FASB has identified criteria in certain areas that hedging transaction must meet before requiring the special accounting for hedges. Number one, documentation, risk man management, and designation. Number two, the effectiveness of the hedging relationship. And number three, the effect on reported earnings of changes in fair value or cash flows. So, 
under GAP, the derivative can be used as speculation. How do we account for that derivative? At fair value with unrealized holding gains and losses recorded in income. Accounting for the hedged item is not applicable. A common example is the call or put option on equity security. Now for hedging fair value, at fair value with holding gains and losses recorded in income, and then at fair value with gains and losses recorded in income. Example is the put option to hedge inventory. And then if we're hedging cash flows, in summary, a fair value with unrealized holding gains and losses from the hedge recorded in other comprehensive income and the reclassified in income when the hedge transactions cash flows affect earnings. We account for that hedged item using, oops, using other gap for the hedged item. And then a common example is the use of futures contract to hedge a forecasted purchase of inventory. Okay, describe the required fair value disclosures. Now here, the FASB believes that the fair value information is relevant for making effective business decisions. Others express concern about fair value measurements for two, re two reasons. Number one, the lack of reliability related to the fair value measurement in certain cases. And number two, uh, the ability to manipulate fair value me measurements. So, in disclosing fair value information, both the cost and the fair value of all financial instruments are to be reported in the notes to the financial statements. The FASB also decided that companies should disclose information that enables users to determine the extent of usage of fair value and the inputs used to implement the fair value measurement. <clears throat> so, the two reasons for the additional disclosure beyond simple itemization of fair values are, number one, differing levels of reliability exist in the measurement of fair value information, and number two, changes in the fair value of the financial instruments are reported differently in the financial statements depending on the type of financial instrument involved and whether the fair value option is employed. Fair value hierarchy. The levels of reliability or fair value hierarchy. Number one, the level one is the most reliable measurement because the fair value is based on quoted prices in active markets for identical assets or liabilities. Level two is less reliable and it is not based on quoted market prices for identical assets and liabilities, but instead may be based on similar assets or liabilities. And then level three is the least reliable and it uses unobservable inputs that reflect the company's assumption as to the value of the financial instrument. Okay, so if we look at the uh, Sabathia company and the notes to the financial statements, you'll see here the fair values, the quoted prices in active market, and then significant, significant other observable inputs, that's level two, and then significant unobservable inputs. So you can see that it's reported as trading securities, available for sale securities, derivatives, and venture capital investments um, in those respective uh, categories, level one, level two, level three. Okay. Now, reconciliation of the level three input here, we have uh, a complete 
a note to the financial statement where the fair value measurements using significant unobservable input, input level three. And so it shows that and how that is uh, uh, broken down. I'll let you read those on your own as that will require a little bit of study. Now, disclosure of fair value when they're impaired complicates things further. And here is uh, the long-lived assets held and used with a carrying amount of 100 million are written down to a value of 75 million. So that resulted in an impairment charge of 25 million, which was included in the earnings for the period. Goodwill with a carrying amount of 65 million was also written down resulting in another impairment charge of 35 million. <clears throat> so in accordance with the provision of the impairment or disposal of long-lived assets subsections of FASB's codification subtopic 360-10, long-lived assets held for sale with a carrying amount of 35 million were written down to their fair value of 26 million, less the cost to sell of 6 million, or in this case, 20 million, resulting in a loss of 15 million, which was then included in earnings for the period. Okay, now we'll take a look at comparing accounting for investments under GAAP and IFRS. Here, the similarities are the GAAP and IFRS use similar classifications for, for financial assets. Bullet point two, both IFRS and GAAP require financial assets to be sorted into specific categories for measurement and classification purposes. Now, bullet point three, held to maturity, GAAP, and held for collection, IFRS investments, are accounted for at amortized costs. Gains and losses on some investments are reported in other comprehensive income. And bullet point four, amortized cost or fair value is used depending upon the classification of the financial instrument. And finally, bullet point five, the definitions of amortized cost and fair values are the same. Now there's more similarities in that both IFRS and GAAP use the same test to determine whether the equity method of accounting should be used. That is significant influence with a general guideline of over 20% ownership. Bullet point two, GAAP and IFRS are similar in accounting for fair value option. That is the option to use fair value method must be made at an initial recognition. The selection is irrevocable and gains and losses are reported as part of income. Differences. While GAAP classifies debt investments as trading available for sale and held for maturity, IFRS classifies debt investments held for collection for debt investment and trading. GAAP requires, bullet point two, that all changes in fair value for all equity securities be reported as part of income. IFRS requires that changes in fair value for non-trading equity securities be reported as part of other comprehensive income. And while measurement of impairments is similar under GAAP at IFRS, GAAP does not permit the reversal of an impairment charge related to held to maturity debt investments and equity investments. IFRS allows reversals of impairments for held for collection investments. And lastly, while GAAP and IFRS are similar in accounting for the fair value option, one difference is that GAAP permits fair value option for equity method of investments, and IFR does not. And that is the end of chapter 16. And when we continue, we'll carry on with chapter 17. Until that time, bye for now.